As time has gone on, people have looked less and less favorably on Banjo-Tooie. It's not hard to see why. It's overly ambitious, at times sacrificing a level's entire structure for one or two gimmicks, the scope leaves areas with vast stretches of absolutely nothing, and the interworld connectivity can make certain jiggies so much more of a pain to collect than others for exactly the same reward. It's seen as the epitome of late 90s rare, making things big or convoluted just to show off and appeal to kids that don't know any better. Despite this, and maybe it's just the nostalgia talking, I still love this game. And hey, it has to have at least some merits, right? It's not Donkey Kong 64. With the game's ambition, a lot of that rare passion comes through, especially in the writing, but also in how the game throws ideas at you without anyone to tell them it's a bad idea. Like Witchy World, with its cheesy theming and dumb minigames feeling exactly like the rundown county fair it's emulating. Or Hailfire Peaks, which connects its two halves not only to other worlds, but to each other to make for some pretty interesting navigational challenges. Or Cloud Cuckoo Land, which necessitates that you pay attention and aren't fooled by the two mumbo skulls or lack of warp pads. All of these levels share a common theme. Intentionally obtuse, sure, but also interesting to navigate because of that. And the best of these, bar none, is the game's sixth world, Grunty Industries. The most striking thing about Grunty Industries is that, at the start, it's completely blocked off. No other level is like this, always giving you a wide world to explore. Even if part of it was separated by a wall, or a toll booth, or a pool of water that somehow becomes breathable by unleashing the power of the sun, it sends an immediate message. Grunty doesn't want you exploring her factory. Not because she has anything to hide, but because Banjo going through it can't lead to anything good. What you have to do is go around back, open up the Chuffy Station, and then go to any other Chuffy Station in a different world and travel to the inside of the factory. Which I guess makes Old King Cole guilty of not only treason, but breaking and entering. Oh well, he's dead. And it makes you feel like a badass, infiltrating the factory from a back entrance and catching Grunty totally off guard. I actually ended up playing Hailfire Peaks before the bulk of this level, just because I was a dumb kid who didn't think they'd pull this trick. But it felt super rewarding to figure it out, and is probably the best use of interworld connectivity that Tui pulls off. Once inside the factory, your options are opened up considerably, but you don't just get free reign of the place. This door to the basement seems creepy and ominous, but there's nothing you can do to get past it. The service elevator is only usable by non-organic personnel, which puts your disgusting meatbag body out of luck. The larger elevator is sealed off on every floor you check, and the trash compactor will probably kill you every time without utilizing a later ability or a cheat code. These rabbits want you to wash their clothes, but even if you could, their skivvy workmates are scattered in places you can't get to yet. And after talking to your old pal Lago the Toilet, the message is clear. You're not Mario, Grunty isn't as shoddy a level designer as Bowser, and exploring this place isn't going to be that easy. But after a bit of doing, you can at least open the main door back outside, making getting in a lot simpler. Tucked away in the corner is the new Claw Clamber Boots power, granting you access to the second floor. Outside of some minor platforming and combat challenges, Floor 2 has two places of note. The Electromagnet Chamber of Questionable Purpose, and Wumba's Wigwam of Questionable Ethnic Stereotyping. In typical Banjo-Tooie fashion, both are blocked off, but at least this time in both cases, you can get to them using an item nearby. And from Humba, you get probably the best utilized transformation in any Banjo-Kazooie game. Oh. No, really. Y you can stop laughing now. Yes, the Humble Washing Machine is the best transformation in the series, at least in the context of how it's used. After being a punchline and a speedrun killer in the first game, and after how restricted the entire level has made you feel, becoming a bulky and useless box seems like the final nail in the coffin. 
until you realize its true potential. Now you can wash all of those skivvies clothes. Now your soulless mechanical husk can access the service elevator, granting you access to the final three floors of the factory. Now you're heavy enough to push this switch and... Well, actually, no, you, you still can't do that. There's a big magnet in the way for some reason, but, but hey! For the first time, you feel like you're making progress. Shooting underwear is fun, the washing machine's extra health comes in handy, and you probably even picked up a few jiggies on the way. As you explore the factory more and more, you find more warp pads, you open more doors to the elevator and outside, and you find more batteries that open more doors for you. It's not unlike an isolated Metroidvania or one of the better Zelda dungeons, unfolding an impenetrable puzzle box into something very easy to navigate and understand by the end. This manifests in small ways, like hidden skivvies or jinjos, to more substantial discoveries, like accessing the majority of Floor 4 after completing a timed navigational challenge. There's even a few mini-games thrown in to act as a fun distraction if you get bored of mapping out the maze. But my favorite, and the ultimate representation of the level's structure, is how you access the level's boss. Remember the electromagnet chamber from Floor 2? Well, on Floor 3, there's a panel that you can unscrew with your build drill technique. Doing so will drop a mumbo pad into the chamber. Also on Floor 3, after giving him a Globo, you can play as Mumbo, the only character Mumbo-y enough to interact with Mumbo Pads. Every stage has unique Mumbo magic, and here, it's an electromagnetic pulse. Hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. But you gotta be quick, because the auto repair system will fix the magnet after 90 seconds. Inconveniently, due to Mumbo's long-standing hatred of all stereotypes more problematic than he is, only Banjo can turn into a washing machine. So stop by Mumbo's skull, drop him off, get Banjo and Kazooie, go to floor 2, transform into a washing machine at Wumba's Wigwam, enter the electromagnet chamber, be careful not to fall into toxic waste, and hit the switch. And finally, that creepy door from the basement you saw way back on floor 1? It slowly opens granting you access inside. It certainly doesn't hurt that the boss is really good as well. Weldar's got many attacks, from hopping around to attacking you with nuts and bolts, to activating this laser grid, which actually requires platforming skill, something of a shocking rarity in 3D platformer boss fights. In order to hurt him, you need to shoot your limited ammo grenade eggs into his mouth while he's inhaling facing the threat of being gobbled up head-on with no room to breathe. And the music. Ah, wonderful. It feels like a standalone, high-intensity piece, instead of just an obligatory level remix with Grant Kirkhope boss trumpets tossed in. After all that, you're rewarded handsomely. Not just with one Jiggy, but two. And a Cheeto page. And as icing, Weldar's severed head will stay here for the rest of the game just so you can laugh at his misery. Decapitation is funny. Eventually, you'll gain access to the flight pads on the roof. And I think that's the moment you know you've conquered Grunty's impenetrable stronghold. What was once so imposing looks so small from up here, and you can bust open the windows to weave in and out of it as you please. And it feels so rewarding to get to that point. Grunty's Industries isn't difficult to navigate because it's large, it's difficult to navigate because it's dense. And the way that it connects every little area and power up into one another shows a dedication and thoughtfulness toward level design unmatched not only by the rest of the game, but most of Tui's contemporaries, even in the modern day. Ironically, it was my least favorite level as a kid, because it was so complex and progression was so slow, but much like the structure of the level itself, it shows more of its true colors and grows on you with time. It's a slow burn, but an appreciable one, and a fantastic testament on how to design for emergence.